you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. For more than 2,000 years, the commission and promise of the Lord Jesus has resonated in the hearts and minds of believers all over the world. And in our day, God is pouring out His Spirit anew to prepare humanity for a fresh proclamation of the gospel. Now is the time of awakening, of conversion, of transformation of every human heart and mind. Yet each day, Christians are confronted with situations that compromise their faith and undermine even the most basic truths. Who is the person of Jesus? How can we come to know Him in a personal way? What does it mean to live as His disciple? Where is He calling us to serve Him? God loves each one of us and is calling us to make an active decision for Him in our lives. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live holy lives and take up His mission in the world. These are the choices we face. Hey, welcome to another week of the choices we face. There's just a lot of encouraging things happening these days in the church, and one of them is just these new young priests that are coming up that are really f filled with, you know, love of God and love of people, and we're very happy today to welcome Father Tim McDonald from the Diocese of Lansing. He's pastor of Most Holy Trinity Parish in Fowler. And we also have Peter Herbeck with us as our co-host today. You know, one of the things I see, Father, I know that you see this too, is that all over the country, really, is like a new breed of young priests coming up that aren't griping and complaining and moaning and groaning, but are really filled with hope and filled with joy. And not that life is always, you know, easy, but, you know, love the church and love people and just are, are filled with love for Christ and are sharing it. And, and just tell us your story about, you know, how you started at the beginning. You were born and then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was uh, born in 1974, so I'm 32 years old and I'm the youngest of six children. And my parents live in Flint, uh, not too far uh, from my parish now, so I get to see my family quite a bit. And uh, what's very interesting is that I'm not the only priest in the family. My uh, older brother, my next oldest brother in the six, is a missionary. He's a Society of the Divine Word missionary mm. who has served in mm. Japan and the Philippines. Uh, his name is Adam. And he and I were ordained on the same day. So the oh. lead up to that oh, was quite a, a momentous thing, yes, in the year 2000. So it's a wonderful celebration of the Jubilee uh, when we were oh. ordained the day before Pentecost. So oh, we wow. had an outpouring yeah. of the Holy Spirit for our yeah. first Mass. And uh, growing up, our parents were always very encouraging in the faith. My father is the choir director and the organist, and our mother, of course, uh, was in charge of the Christian Service Commission. Oh, wow. And uh, she loves to tell us that twice during her youth, she considered the religious life. And uh, she went to two different convents to give it a try, then realized she was called to be a wife and a mother. Uh, but we say we got one vocation for each time she went into the convent. So <laughs> God has still been blessed by it. Uh -huh. And uh, my parents always encouraged us in the faith, encouraged us to be open to God's call. And my brother, Father Adam, is four years older than me, and he went off to the seminary uh, in Iowa. Uh, to this missionary seminary in the middle of nowhere. And we thought, where did he hear about this religious community and what on earth is he doing? But I noticed the transformation that occurred in his life during that time and uh, it began to be contagious. You know, mm -hmm. kind of spread on to me as the youngest mm -hmm. in the family. Mm -hmm. I admired him always, and uh, his priestly example, even as a seminarian, was something that I found very encouraging. Not to mention a holy priest, uh, Father Matt Fidua, was our pastor from the time I was a baby until mm -hmm. I almost graduated high school. Mm -hmm. And I think there's nothing better to encourage a vocation than a priest who loves his vocation. Yeah. In fact, Father Matt is now a retired priest, but he just signed on to be on the formation faculty at the St. John Vianney Seminary in Minnesota, where the Diocese yeah. of Lansing sends most of its college seminarians. And so he's going to continue Wonderful. to inspire more vocations as he did yeah. mine. I remember meeting Father Matt with the <coughs> Teens Encounter Christ. He, yes. he actually developed that he program. He founded it, yes. Uh, and it became a way of reaching teenagers all over the country. It know? was very exciting that uh, he founded that in Battle Creek. He was at St. Mm -hmm. Philip's Church there. And uh, then as his diocesan assignments began to change, he had to, uh, to pass it on to someone else. And he really didn't even know that it continued without him. Mm -hmm. And yet they called him back in about 1990 and invited him to speak at their 25th anniversary international convention. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and I had the honor of driving him down there along with another young man who's also a priest of our diocese now. Uh -huh. uh, so he inspired us both. And just to see the, the adoration of the, uh, the people there when they met the founder of, mm -hmm. of Tech, oh, yeah. uh, it was quite inspiring. Yeah, great. And, and he was was very good to us and supported us in our vocation. And, uh, you know, in terms of my own priestly calling, 
I had a girlfriend in high school and had some other ambitions, but then the Lord just uh, molded my heart mm -hmm. and said, you won't be content unless you serve me. Mm -hmm. And uh, during my senior year of high school, uh, Father Matt left our parish for a new assignment to the diocese, and the new pastor I didn't know very well and didn't know how to approach him about this topic. Uh, I wasn't as gregarious then as I am now, so I decided I'm going to have to write him a letter. So in this, these days, we didn't have the computers yet, so I got out the electric typewriter and thought, I'll just send a brief letter. But it ended up being three pages, single-spaced. I thought I had to start from the beginning. And I think I was as much writing it to me and to God as I was to the pastor. But he got the ball rolling. We met with the vocation director, and I went out to the seminary and uh, have never looked back since. Mm, great. Mm. What's it like, though, uh, after you got ordained? I mean, you know, there, there's the seminary, and then there's... The real life of the parish. Reality sets yeah, in, yes. Yeah. What, the, what was that like for you? Was that a hard Well, what was most interesting yeah. is that uh, Father John Klein was the first pastor I was assigned with at St. Gerard Church in Lansing, a big suburban church, about 3,000 families. And he was actually an associate pastor when I was a, a child. Mm. So he was the priest that heard my first confession. Oh. So our joke when I was serving with him is uh, that must have been some penance. <laughs> 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 but then Father Matt moved in as well. So the priest that gave me my first communion and the priest that heard my first confession were both living in the rectory with me and serving with me. And uh, they were my heroes growing up. So it's, uh, you know, getting to be with the people who inspire me. Yeah, that must have been really, really special. Well, tell us a little bit more about uh, the ordination day for you and your brother. How did, how did that work? You both... You got ordained together, uh, even though he was in a religious order? Or we, he and I spoke with each other before we were ordained uh, to the diaconate. Uh, I was ordained in Rome at St. Peter's. He was ordained three weeks before in Chicago uh, at their provincial headquarters in Techni, Illinois, near O'Hare Airport. And we said uh, our priestly ordinations were at that point scheduled to be one week apart. And we thought, well, that would be cumbersome for the family, first and foremost, to have to go to Chicago one weekend, come to Lansing the next weekend. So other people started suggesting, well, why don't you see if you can do it together? So I asked our bishop, Carl Mengling. He asked the uh, provincial of his uh, religious community, and they both thought it was a great idea. And then it was decided that it would happen in Lansing. What's very interesting is he also had to ask his confreres. He was to be ordained with 11 brothers that he'd been in formation with for 11 years. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they thought it was a wonderful thing as well. Mm -hmm. And they all came. So on June the 10th, oh, wow. 2000, it was a wonderful outpouring of grace uh, at St. Mary Cathedral in Lansing. There were two others ordained as well. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, Father Tim Nelson, who was a medical doctor. Yeah. They gave up his practice, 49 yeah. years old. There was Father Mike Petrosky, who had been a social worker and uh, was in his 50s. And and, uh, and then two brothers. So it's really just, uh, you saw the, the whole gamut of vocations at one Now, how did you mass. both do your first Mass then, the next day, was it? We had to make a, how should we say, a compromise. That we both decided, well, we'll just take the morning for the parish. There are only two Masses there. And so he celebrated the first Mass, and I preached. And then I celebrated the second Mass, and he preached. <laughs> so we shared the honors. And a lot of people yeah. went to both Masses, right? We had your a party in between uh, and after. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Was, uh, the celebrations never ended, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, tell, tell me what it's like. What, what, you know, what do you see now when you look out at your parish and... What do you feel like the Lord's showing you, and what do you see as your, your service in that parish? Well, the Lord certainly challenged me that after only two years of being a priest, I was called upon to be a pastor. I was only 28 years old. When that's I that's became, becoming more and more common, isn't it? It sure is. You used to have 20 years to, to learn, that's exactly to learn what the Father, trade. That's what Father Matt said to me when it happened. He said, you know, it took me 20 years to become a pastor, and now yeah. they're doing it in two. And granted, some of my seminary classmates, they become pastor right upon ordination, yeah. and not always of just one parish. Some are pastoring three and four. Yeah, it's um, really different, isn't but it? But Fowler yeah. is such a beautiful and traditional community. The roots of the Catholic faith are deeply, deeply planted there. This is... Uh, the 125th anniversary year of the parish. And is, isn't that the area of the Diocese, Fowler and Westphalia, where like so many vocations have come over the years for the Diocese of Lansing? Father like, Matt Fiedema, he's from Westphalia. Yeah. His brother, Monsignor Sylvester Fiedema, yeah. is from uh, uh, Westphalia. And the Salins around, aren't there? Oh, yeah. there's a wonderful German heritage. In our parish, as we're celebrating our anniversary, we decided to, uh, to look back as a way of preparing to go forward. And we have found that in the 125 years of the parish, there have been 40 women that have entered the religious life. Mm. There have been 19 priests ordained, mm. one permanent deacon. And now we have four seminarians that are in formation for the priesthood. And and two young ladies that are discerning the religious life. Yeah. So uh, the outpouring of the spirit continues. Bed of real Catholic life. That's pretty. We think there's something in the water. <laughs> 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 I keep blessing it every time it comes out of the tap. Yes, I should. Thing, you know? <laughs> that would be a wonderful fundraiser for the parish. <laughs> and the people there uh, 
tend to be closely related mm. and, and people stay together. You know, the families don't move as much as many do in our current culture. And I think that allows for a, a stronger fabric. Mm -hmm. And the faith is the, is the center of everything. There's only two churches in Fowler, our church and a Lutheran church. There's only one church in Westphalia, and that's St. Mary's Catholic Church. Mm. And uh, most of the people in the town belong to these parishes. And uh, they build their whole life around it. They're born there, they get married there, they have their children baptized there, and one day they'll be buried there. Those are a vanishing breed, those kinds of parishes aren't they? With it that certainly kind of stability is. And, it's a very yeah. small and rural town. Yeah. I suppose we can get away with that. Our population mm. is only 1,136 according to the 2000 census. Mm. And uh, I've lived in cities all of my life and thought, Lord, what are you doing sending me out to the countryside? But what's interesting is just two weeks before I found out I was going there, I had said to my mother, I think for my next assignment that I'm going to be called to the country. Mm. And little did I know when I attended the funeral of the previous pastor, the bishop came up to me as soon as it was <laughs> over and said, do you like it here? Because you're coming here. <laughs> but uh, he actually actually told me, he said, uh, there's no one else. That's what he said. He was still dressed in his funeral vestments and whatnot. And yes, we'd had many priests die and retire, so obviously mm -hmm. it was necessary to become a pastor. But when your bishop tells you there's nowhere, nowhere, no one else to do the job, what can you say? Yeah. there's an optimist and a pessimist point of view, though. Yeah. The, the optimist says that I'm the only person of all the right. priests in the diocese that can give the bishop what he needs on this job. The pessimist says everyone else said no. Yeah. But it was the, the greater glory of God. Uh -huh. So yeah. I said yes, and, uh, and that's what I think the priesthood is all about, along with being a committed Catholic, uh -huh. is just saying yes. Uh -huh. God is not going to ask us to do anything that's going to harm our salvation. And uh, to be a priest and to be able to encourage other people to uh, pursue the road of salvation is an inspiration to me as much as I might inspire other people. Uh -huh. And I think that's the beauty of the priesthood is that, yes, people say, well, you spend your whole life giving to other people, but they have no idea how much I receive in the act of giving. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus explained that for us perfectly, uh, that you will receive so much blessings, uh, so many blessings from the Lord, a hundredfold for the gifts you bestow upon other people, and that's what I've found to be true in my priestly ministry. Mm -hmm. What do you find most challenging about the priesthood? Most challenging about the priesthood, I think, would often be... Uh, when you look down the line and, and you look at the numbers, we, we have a commission now established in Lansing to look at uh, the number of parishes, the number of Catholics, and the number of priests we'll have to serve them, and how are we going to coordinate ministry so that everybody in every part of the diocese can continue to receive the sacraments. And we see, you know, in a transition period before we can get more people ordained and out there into the parishes, that there's going to be some lean years and uh, the workload at times can be overwhelming. But at the end of a very long day, if I can say that I spent every hour serving the Lord, mm -hmm. uh, then it was a challenge that I met, and the Lord helped mm -hmm. me to get through every bit of it. And mm -hmm. I think also there's a need to restore the trust of the people, that obviously the priesthood has been under attack mm -hmm. uh, by the media, by the devil, whatever you want mm -hmm. to call it. There, there are dark forces that are at work to take away people's respect for the church and for the priesthood. And I think the greatest challenge I can have is uh, to make sure that I'm praying Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't ask other people to pray or teach them how if I'm mm -hmm. not doing it first. Mm -hmm. And then I have to be a witness. So if I'm not living the gospel I'm preaching, then it's why bother getting up and preaching. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's really good. Hey, we're going to take a little break, and then we're going to come back and continue. Every single class that I have taken here in the two years that I've been here has set the light of Christ on fire in my heart, and I will be taking that out with me no matter where I go. I found that not only do I have here a group of my peers that will challenge me on an academic level, but have also embraced me as a member of a family, a Christ-centered family. Franciscan University is academically challenging and passionately Catholic. Welcome back to The Choices We Face. We're here today talking with Father Tim McDonald from Holy Trinity Parish in Fowler, Michigan. And Father's been telling us just about his story of getting a vocation, becoming a priest, uh, the hard work, the joy, the challenge. And one of the things you mentioned, Father, is you actually studied in Rome. And yes. I think it was during a pretty significant time in the life of the church that you were there in Rome. You know, did you... Did any of those things impact you, or you have any connection with what was happening there? Well, I think certainly the opportunity for a seminarian or a priest to study in Rome just gives you an idea of how universal the church really is, that uh, when living at the Pontifical North American College with men from 
80 some dioceses across America, 43 different states were represented. Uh, you develop friendships uh, with men that will last the rest of your life. In just a few weeks, I'll be vacationing with uh, a priest from Georgia, a priest from Illinois, and a priest from Florida, where we all meet in one other place and, and celebrate for a week and have mass together, pray together, and some fellowship. And then you go to the university. Uh, for us, it was the Pontifical Gregorian University, run by the Jesuits, a longstanding tradition. And there were people from every corner of the globe that were studying there. Of course, we had to study in Italian. Uh, that was a little bit of a downer, I suppose. And uh, don't ask me to speak in it now. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> exactly. We'll leave it there. Arrivederci. <laughs> but it was uh, a wonderful opportunity to just get connected with the Church of the World, but also the Church of Rome that we all serve uh, under our Holy Father's discretion. And meeting John Paul II uh, was such a, a, a gracious occasion. I got so nervous, I meant to call him Your Holiness, but I said, Your Honor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I think he was concentrating on prayer, so uh, it yeah. did not disturb him. But another advantage of being uh, a student in Rome is uh, we get to be ordained to the diaconate there. And on the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, October the 7th, 1999, myself and 39 others were ordained to St. Peter's with our families present. And uh, what was uh, now become an even more special memory was the fact that the ordaining prelate was uh, His Eminence Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, oh. whom we now know to be, uh, you know, Pope Benedict the yeah. And it was very special then because he had many fans in the seminary community. And, uh, and then to see him become our Holy Father, it uh, makes my ordination seem that much more connected with the life of the church. And uh, so I was there until the Jubilee year 2000, then came home to be ordained and serve in parish ministry. But I was called back to Rome to finish a licentiate degree at the Gregorian and to live at the Graduate House of Priests, uh, the Casa Santa Maria. And that was in the fall of 2004 and the spring of 2005. And there in the spring of 2005, of course, uh, were the last days of John Paul II. And I had come back to help with uh, Holy Week in the parish in Fowler. And I was in the airport in Detroit on my way back to Rome to finish the school year uh, when I was watching on the concourse television and John Paul had passed away. Mm. And uh, then my flight got canceled because of weather, but I did make it there the next day. And the first thing I did was go to St. Peter's to get in line for the viewing of his body. And uh, I felt very fortunate that I waited in line for just five hours until three mm. in the morning. But mm. there were people, of course, that were waiting 12 and 18 and 24 mm -hmm. hours. And it was just a, a wonderful experience of the church to see so many people, even non-Catholics, non-Christians, all love John Paul II, mm -hmm. and they were all gathered there, and everything was orderly, and uh, finding order in Rome is, uh, is where there's such chaos. Was there were no Italian nuns elbowing you, trying yeah. to get ahead of you in the line? Well, we haven't talked about the papal funeral yet, okay. but uh, in yeah. terms of viewing the body, there was orderliness <laughs> and peace. Okay. And, uh, and it was really a very emotional moment for everyone that was there, because yeah. people like me, uh, being born in 1974, I was too young to remember Pope Paul VI or John Paul I, so I certainly am a priest of the John Paul II generation, so my heart was moved. And, uh, and then to be there during the conclave, very exciting. Uh, fortunately, it was brief, so we didn't have to make too many trips back and forth. It took half an hour to get to the Vatican from where we were living. And uh, we kept going back and looking for the white smoke. And then the, the afternoon of April the 19th, uh, two priest friends wanted to go there. And uh, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I said, well, that seems pretty early. I thought they wouldn't burn the ballots until 7. Uh, but they said, well, we don't want to miss it. And we got there just in the nick of time. Oh. And there was just mass confusion because we couldn't tell what color the smoke was. And as, they said the bells sure. were going to ring, and there were no bells. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, the Angelus bells rang, and then the big bell began to ring. And that's when we realized, abemos papam. And when the cardinal came out and announced that, the crowd erupted. And as soon as we heard uh, the name Joseph, yeah. then we realized who it was. And I don't think there was a dry eye in that whole square. Yeah. And it was amazing to me how quickly that piazza filled up. It was about half full when we got there. But within minutes, people came from all over the city, getting off the subways, the taxis, off the buses, running on foot, uh, leaving their cars in the road. Mm. And everyone wanted to be there for that moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have those experiences to look back on now and, uh, and still be quite content serving in a small rural parish in America. Yeah. Uh, the, the beauty of knowing that anywhere in the world that you go, you can find the Catholic Mass, you can find a Catholic priest, and uh, that's something that should be very comforting to every Catholic. Yeah. Yeah, the universality of the church is w one of the things that's really remarkable. All over the world, the church has a presence, and it's just uh, it's really wonderful. And you, you really saw it while you were there in Rome. You yes, the opportunity to travel Rome. to different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1997, four of us went to India and had the opportunity to work with the Missionaries of Charity. 
and uh, we met with Mother Teresa. We spent a week with her, oh. and that was just five weeks before her death. You're hanging around with saints, Father. Maybe it's rubbing I may off be in the presence you. of two right now. <laughs> no. you know, they'll talk about it later. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> What, what are some of the positive things you see happening in your parish? Like, it sounds like it's a well-established parish, it's solid, it's not in crises. So what, what do you see then as your task there? What, what, like, what room do you see for growth or development? Or? Certainly what we need to do is uh, to focus on the education of our young people. We are blessed to have a Catholic school, and uh, yet, as with many Catholic schools and smaller families, uh, it is a challenge to convince parents to pay for their children's education mm -hmm. when they consider for their taxpayer dollar they could have it for free. Uh, but we're devoting a lot of time and energy to strengthening our school uh, because three of the four seminarians that we have currently from our parish attended the Catholic school mm -hmm. and one was homeschooled. And mm -hmm. uh, so we see a great future there in strengthening the Catholic education. And that extends also to our religious education program. It's very interesting that in the small towns of Fowler and Westphalia, religious education happens during the public school day. That the public school and the Catholic school are right Right next door and their children come over to our building uh, twice a week during the day for an hour of religious education wow. so it's a real a release time thing or, yes yeah, release yeah. time is exactly In what the we state call of it. Michigan yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's legal yeah I hope so if we're talking about it on television <laughs> yeah. yeah we don't want to get shut down <laughs> yeah but it's been yeah. a wonderful opportunity I, when I was growing up I actually went to public school because there are, our parish closed at school uh, decades before I came around and uh, the opportunity to bring those children, not just for one hour a week, but for two. Mm. And uh, I have mass with them and bring them to confession. That's wonderful. It's an opportunity yeah. to make sure that everybody gets the best that we have to That's offer. That's tremendous. Because they yeah. are the future of the church, yeah. and they're under attack. They are yeah. under attack by the modern secular culture uh, that tells them to go your own way. Yeah, even though they grew up in a traditional Catholic German culture, they're not immune from uh, television and r radio. You know, it used to be that and... uh, Lansing is the nearest city of size to Fowler, and it used to be that a family might go there once a week. But now we have people that go there twice a day. Yeah. Many of our people work there uh, mm -hmm. for the university, Michigan State University, mm -hmm. or for the state of Michigan and the government offices since Lansing's the capital city. And being that close uh, to bigger city influences, the internet, of course, brings mm -hmm. whatever you want yeah. and even many things you don't want yeah. or need into your home. Yeah. So we find that we do have to fight for souls because yeah. the battle's being waged everywhere. Yeah. And fortunately, we have parents uh, who are on the side of truth and we yeah. want to recruit more and more of them. Yeah, that's great. What, what else is going on in your parish? What, what else are you working on? Well, as on? I mentioned, this is our 125th anniversary year, and we have a beautiful, beautiful sanctuary. The, the original church that was built in 1881 served as the parish church for 37 years, and then 88 years ago in 1918, they built a, a glorious Gothic style uh, church uh, made of stone and brick, and on the inside, beautiful archways and the most beautiful stained glass I've encountered in a church in our diocese with the joyful mysteries of the rosary on the west side, the glorious mysteries on the east side, and yet it had become run down with age. And so last year we initiated an effort to, uh, to restore our sanctuary, not to renovate. Uh, too many churches are renovating and losing the sacredness, but to restore. So we started a pledge campaign. We wanted to raise $300,000, or $300, I should say, just to make some improvements. Mm -hmm. And yet within 12 days we had the 300000 and before the campaign was over we had twice as much as we asked for. Wow. And uh, the people were really stepping on board to give glory to God. So wow. that enabled us to uh, completely restore the inside of the church and uh, to put the murals back in the ceiling that used to be there of angels adoring the Blessed Sacrament, uh, to buy new statues and have everything refurbished so that mm -hmm. God's house uh, will be a place where people think of heaven. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm now encountering that Fowler is becoming a little bit of a tourist destination, Isn't that people it? are coming from many different places because they've heard about the church mm -hmm. and, uh, and they go in there and they tell me, when I look up at that sanctuary, I can't but think of heaven. Well, is that great? Oh, yeah. it's very encouraging. Yeah, well, that's that, wonderful, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, then what are your pastoral priorities in the parish? Kind of, how do you come to them and what are they? My pastoral priorities, first and foremost, are uh, educating the children and also in preparing couples for marriage. We, mm -hmm. I've had over 20 weddings in that small town this summer, and that gives us wow. a seedbed of opportunity. There's yeah. so many children and so many young people that are yeah. now growing up and they're stepping forth in married life, and uh, I need to use that as an opportunity to evangelize them mm -hmm. because fortunately, 
really, for the most part, they're not cohabitating, and uh, that gives us a golden opportunity to help them to continue to see Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life for the families that they're going to raise. Mm -hmm. And that's what this campaign for our anniversary was all about, that our ancestors built it for us. What are we going to pass on to our children? So we're looking at the future yeah. and how to prepare the Fowler Catholics uh, for this third millennium and the new springtime of the church, yeah. which uh, is already that's, bearing that's fruit. amazing because I, I run into so many priests who find it so hard now to do marriage preparation with so many of the couples mm -hmm. seem to not even know what Christian marriage is and are cohabiting and and, mm -hmm. and, it, and certainly it, all these sacramental preparation things are now not just catechesis but evangelization. People have to be drawn to the vision. Of Fortunately Christ. for us, uh, Fowler was settled mostly by German immigrants mm -hmm. and uh, Germans certainly live according to the rule of law and order, even within the church. That's tremendous. And that's given yeah. us an opportunity yeah. to uh, evangelize them on certain non-negotiable points, like mm -hmm. all of my engaged couples have to attend the natural family planning classes. Mm -hmm. We don't just have them watch a video, we mm -hmm. make them participate in the whole class yeah. because I'm a big believer. If you want someone to uh, obey the church's teaching, you have to teach them why and yeah. then you have to show them how. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's really great. Great, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, what else do you kind of build into your marriage preparation by way of evangelization? You know? Evangelization in the marriage preparation program, I found certainly the most important aspect is to uh, help them to feel comfortable praying together. Because I'm a big believer that uh, Catholic culture has fallen by the wayside because uh, being Catholic has fallen by the wayside in the family home. Uh, to mm -hmm. think of the family rosary families attending mass together during the week. These things just aren't part of the current family's Catholic culture. Mm -hmm. And to, to try to restore those traditions, to encourage people not only to come to mass, which we put a great emphasis on and do very well at, but to encourage them to be praying in the home yeah. and modeling their faith for their children. Yeah. And uh, that's a, a wonderful gift. The greatest gift that they're ever going to give their children is not necessarily the college trust fund or the car for their 16th birthday, but a love for Jesus. You know, it, it is so wonderful to hear you say that because so many parents have drifted into what I most want for my children is a good education or a good job yes. or this sort of thing or good health, and they, they just don't think anymore of the destiny of the immortal soul. The I eternal, find that yeah. same problem in trying to inspire vocations, that we actually encounter resistance at times among parents, uh, though they've been lifelong mm -hmm. Catholics and claim to cherish their faith. They do not want their children to pursue a vocation to the priesthood or the religious life. So we have to break down those barriers and ask why. And, and my, the first question I ask myself is, have I portrayed the priesthood poorly in some mm -hmm. way? Do I have a dour expression on my face? Where's my joy for Jesus? I think you're portraying it great. And I think what people need is to hear the biblical worldview about yes. life is short and only one thing mm -hmm. is necessary. Father, thank you so much for being with us thank today. Thank you for having me. It's been a joy. And giving your life to thank Christ you, and serving the church. And, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we here at Renewal Ministries want to do anything we can to help you respond to Jesus and be a light and be, be a source of truth where you are. And Peter Herbeck's written this booklet called To Walk by the Spirit. And we'd like to offer it to you at no cost, just for the asking. And if you call the 800 number or write to the address on the screen, we'll get it right off to you. Until next week, this is Ralph Martin and Peter Herbeck and Father Tim McDonald and a whole host of other young priests like himself who are rising up and saying, Jesus is the Lord, the church is true, and this is the whole meaning and purpose of life. God bless you. Is the Holy Spirit active in your life? Do you feel you're walking alone in the world? Jesus said, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Do you see his hand in your daily experience? Today, for many who have been baptized, the Spirit is a doctrine to be believed in, not a reality of personal experience. St. Paul tells us that we are called to walk in the Spirit and to live in the Spirit. Every baptized person is given the gift of this unique relationship with God. Hi, I'm Peter Herbeck, and I'd like to help you discover and experience the power of the Holy Spirit in your daily life. I've written a booklet called To Walk by the Spirit, and I'd like to make it available to you free of charge just for the asking. Call 1-800-282-4789 or go to renewalministries.net.